hymnals, if you will, to hymn number 194. You must be born again. Let's stand together. Number 194. see everybody. If you will open your Bibles to Psalm 24. <clears throat> Psalm 24. Brother Bob was scheduled to read this evening and uh, Vicki had took a pretty nasty fall in the middle of the night last night and uh, hasn't went to the hospital yet and uh, I think he's endeavoring to try to talk her into going. He's probably got a fight on his hands I'd say but uh, as you can remember him and her Lord lays that on your heart. Psalm 24, begin in verse 1. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world, and they that dwell therein. For he hath founded it upon the seas and established it upon the floods. Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord, or who shall stand in his holy place? He that hath clean hands and a pure heart who hath not lifted up his soul unto vanity, nor sworn deceitfully. He shall receive the blessing from the Lord, and righteousness from the God of his salvation. This is the generation of them that seek him, that seek thy face, O Jacob, Selah. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be ye lift up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord 
strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, even lift them up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. Let's pray. Father, as it pleases you, be with us tonight, Lord. Gather two or three of your sheep here and proclaim our King of kings, our Lord of lords, through your servant. What a privilege it is to be in your house, Lord. Comfort those that aren't with us. And keep them as you promised you will. Give them peace in their hearts. Give them assurance in the object of our faith. It's in Christ's name that we ask it. Amen. If you're all here on a Tuesday, I hope you know why we're here. Uh, Brother Clay Curtis is in from Ewing, New Jersey. And uh, I got him, talked him into coming down one more time and uh, look forward to the message the Lord gave you. So you come preach to us, brother. All right, brethren, let's open our Bibles to Proverbs 13. So good to be with you again, and <clears throat> pray the Lord to be pleased to meet with us. Proverbs 13. Verse 10. Only by pride cometh contention, but with the well-advised is wisdom. Only by pride cometh contention, but with the well advised is wisdom. Now he does not say by pride only comes contention. That would be true. By pride only comes contention. The only thing pride is going to result in is strife and contention. That's so. But he says here, only by pride cometh contention. In other words, if there is contention, if there is strife, the cause is always pride. It's always pride. That's true in unbelievers, and that's true in believers. You know, we like to try to figure out what caused this and that and want to get to the bottom of it. The Lord settles that for us right here. If there's strife, if there's contention, Pride caused it. Only by pride cometh contention. Now, first of all, Satan's fall and man's fall was due to pride. Satan's fall and man's fall was due to pride. Look with me in Isaiah 14. I'm going to turn to quite a few scriptures, and I hope we can turn to some of these. I may have you get there quickly without... Uh, me necessarily having you turn to some of these, but Isaiah 14, verse 12. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which did weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. This was the sin of the devil. He was not an elect angel. Christ said he abode not in the truth. And when he heard God declare that his son was going to become a man and redeem his people and get all the glory and the salvation of his people, pride wouldn't have it. And he said, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. And the devil's temptation of Eve had to do with pride. He entered the garden by God's permission, accomplishing exactly what God determined for him to accomplish. But his temptation, his beguiling of Eve, had to do with pride. He said to the woman, you shall not surely die. God said, if you eat this tree, in the day you eat, you shall surely die. And the serpent said, you will not surely die. 
God doth know that in the day you eat thereof, then your eyes will be open, and you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Adam disobeyed God, and pride slew him, and slew all mankind in him. And we all sinned in Adam and became desperately guilty before God by his one transgression. And being born of Adam, we have a sin nature that's nothing but pride. That's all our sin nature is, is pride. Now, what is pride? Pride is thinking ourselves to be something when God says we are nothing. Pride is thinking ourselves to be something when we are nothing. Paul said in Galatians 6 verse 3, If a man think himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. Pride is an overestimation of our own worth, valuing ourselves of more value than we really are, esteeming ourselves better than others. That's what pride is. Philippians 2, 3, Paul said, Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory. That's what our text is saying. Only by pride cometh contention, strife. He said, let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind. Let each esteem other better than themselves. Pride is the opposite of that. Pride is esteeming self better than others. That's what pride is. And only by pride cometh contention. Esteeming ourselves better than God is the pride which keeps a sinner from coming to God, and it keeps God from having anything to do with the sinner. Psalm 10, 4 says, The wicked, through the pride of his countenance, will not seek after God. God is not in all his thoughts. His ways are always grievous. Thy judgments are far above out of his sight. God's judgments are out of his sight. As for all his enemies, he puffs at his enemies. The man who's lifted up in pride, he puffs at his enemies. He says, I shall not be moved. I shall never be in adversity. Pride keeps the sinner from bowing to God, bowing to his word, confessing he's an ungodly sinner worthy of nothing but condemnation from God. Pride won't let a man bow to God and say, God is true, I'm a liar, I'm the sinner. God's just in, in saying I deserve condemnation. Pride won't let a man do that. This is what, and when God brings a man down, this is what God did for David. And this is what a prideful man can't do. When David, after he had sinned in the, in the uh, incident with uh, uh, Bathsheba and God came and chastened him, he, he said to God, I acknowledge my transgressions. My sin is ever before me. Against thee and thee only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest and clear when thou judgest. Pride won't let a man say that. He won't let a man confess that to God. And pride keeps a sinner from believing on Christ because he doesn't think he needs another righteousness. He thinks he's righteous. And pride won't let him come to Christ and bow down and confess Christ to be his only righteousness and his only holiness. Men speak of holiness. There is a holiness when God creates a new man within us. That new man's created in the holiness of Christ. But that new man in the holiness thereof is Christ in you. But that, when that work's done, he makes you behold that there's only one who ever served God in this earth with a perfectly holy heart in perfect righteousness. And that one is Christ Jesus. And he's the perfect righteousness and perfect holiness of every believer. But pride won't let men confess this. Now, believer, I want you to get this. Every child born of the Spirit of God, right now, our sin nature, our old man within us, is nothing but pride. Still. That's all that's in us is pride in our sin nature. Know this now. When contention or strife arises just in your heart, it's only by pride. Pride's the only cause of it. It's the sin nature. It's pride. When it comes out in a critical word or some other form, and it's only by pride. 
That's all it is. It's pride in us that complains about God's providence. It's pride that makes us sin in thought, word, and deed. Sin is only pride being, being manifest. Pride when we do not esteem our brethren better than ourselves. It's pride to exalt ourselves if we find fault or we're critical or, or something, you know, we get our will crossed or whatever and we're offended. That's pride. That's what that is. Now that's in me and in you. We both have that. As born again believers with a new spirit and a new nature, we have an old man that's still only pride. As long as we have this sin nature, pride, this sin nature is a well. And as long as we have this old sin nature in us, pride is going to flow forth like a stream until we put off this body of death. It's going to be with us. And it's our number one enemy. We talk about self-righteousness. That's what it is. It's pride. It's pride. And it's going to be with us. It's going to plague us from, from now till we put off this body of death. I was working on this when I was up in rescue. I was studying on this text and, and reading scriptures about pride and and I took a break and I went to a restaurant to grab something to eat and I walk in this restaurant and nobody's in the restaurant it's about two in the afternoon it's a place you walk up place your order and they make they fill your plate as you go down the line you know and it's real quick you can get in and out and one lady walks in right ahead of me and she walks up and all I wanted was a little box of them Chinese lo mein noodles. That's all I wanted. Take take five minutes to fix it and I'd be gone. Well, this lady was ordering food for her whole office. And this they had 20 boxes stacked out there and they was trying to load those and reheat and stuff for her. And, and, you know, and, and I started thinking, now all she had to do, knowing what she was going to order, all she had to do was say, sir, I'm about to order for an entire office. I'm going to be here for 20 minutes. If you don't have a big order. You want to go ahead of me? And so I left. I said, I'm not going to sit here and wait on her. And every bit of that was pride in me. Thinking, now, I deserve better than this. She should have given me the courtesy of going in front of her. Nothing but pride. There was enough sin and pride in that to send all of us to hell. That's right. That's all it was was pride our text says only by pride cometh contention that was contention in my heart I was strife in my heart over that but our text also says with the well advised is wisdom with the well advised is wisdom God makes the chosen sinner well advised by Christ our wisdom counseling us effectually in the new man let me say that again. This well-advised wisdom that we're given is by Christ the Counselor, Christ who is wisdom, speaking effectually into our heart and counseling us in our heart to make us hear and subdue our sin nature, subdue our flesh, and renew us inwardly in the new man. And that's all of Christ. Bless God, he chose a people before this world was made. Chose a people in Christ, elected us unto salvation, and he trusted us to Christ. Christ is the wisdom of God. And it's by Christ speaking into our heart that we're going to be well advised. This word well advised is a passive word, and it's a continual word. It's something that's done to us and continues to be done to us. It's Christ advising his child in the heart with wise counsel, making us wise, giving us the mind of Christ. So from the first hour that he brings a sinner to himself, and throughout our days, whenever our sin nature is subdued and the new man is, is, is made meek and humble, Christ gets the glory because he's the one that's doing this. Now, there's three things that are always involved. Turn with me to John chapter 7. I preached on this a few weeks ago, and I'm not going to labor it, but I do want to show you these three things that's always involved in this. Whether it's the first hour that he does this, or 
ongoing, and you, we're coming here to hear the gospel. Why? I pray Christ is doing this in our hearts tonight, because this is how he does it. He does it in his gospel. He does it as, he, as we leave from hearing the gospel. We go look into his word, and we see it, and he makes it, he makes it alive in your heart. And this is how, this is how our flesh is subdued and, and made to be restrained by the grace of God and how he continually renews you inwardly to walk after him. This is how he does it. Now, there's three things involved. I'll tell you what they are, and then we'll briefly comment on them. Number one, he's going to always make you come to Christ. That's where it starts. We have to come to Christ. Number two, he's going to make us hear that we personally are the sinner. And number three, he's going to make us know Christ has made us complete. This is how humility is created in a child of God. First of all, it says here in John 7, 17, the Pharisees heard Christ at the Feast of Tabernacles and they just couldn't believe how he knew all this doctrine. And he's here as the servant of God and he says to them in verse 15, my doctrine's not mine, it's the fathers that sent me. And listen to this statement. If any man will do his will, if any man will do the Father's will, what is that? What is it to do God the Father's will? He said in John 6, this is the Father's will that sent me, that all that believeth on me shall be saved. Doing the Father's will is coming to Christ in faith. It's believing on Christ. And he says here, if any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. But this is true throughout our life. When you come to Christ in faith and he really makes you hear him, you're going to know the doctrine. You're going to know what he's teaching you. And that's the only way we know is when we brought to Christ and Christ our prophet teaches us effectually in our heart. That's how we know the doctrine. That's how we know. Now, while dead in sins... No sinner will come to Christ to hear the doctrine. No sinner will come to Christ. Sinners will be religious. Sinners will hear messages preached. Sinners will read the scriptures. But here's what we were doing while we were dead in sin. We were listening for something we could do to make ourselves just with God and bring ourselves to God. We were searching this book for something we could do to justify ourselves before God. What made the difference? The Lord drew us to Christ, made us hear Christ, made him wisdom to us, and made us start listening to what he said. Now, as believers, sometimes we get lifted up in pride, and we do the same thing we did when we was dead in sin. We start hearing the gospel preached, but we're not hearing Christ, and we're not even listening for Christ. Have you ever done this? You sat and listened to a message, and you're thinking of somebody else that offended you, and you're thinking, boy, I hope they're hearing that. We're never supposed to hear the word of God that way. We're supposed to hear Christ speak to us, condemning us, or instructing us, or, or encouraging us, but we're not supposed to hear it applying it to somebody else. We're supposed to hear it for ourselves. When offenses come, it's pride that makes us go to these scriptures and look for a word in this scripture to prove ourselves right and another wrong. That's wrong. That's always wrong if we go to the word of God with the motive of proving ourselves right and proving somebody else wrong. It's pride that won't let us show mercy, won't let us forgive a brother or a sister that sinned against us or has sinned. It's pride that won't do that. And God lets us find what we seek in this word. Whatever we're willing to look for in this word, God will let you find it. If a man is not his, God will let him go to these scriptures and imagine that he justifies himself for rejecting brethren and separating himself from brethren. He will let you find that in this book. There's plenty of scriptures you can find in here to justify that if that's what you're willing to do. And, and a man that does that may not leave religion, but what he'll do is he'll leave the true gospel, he'll leave brethren who are God's true people, and he'll leave Christ. And he proves by that he never knew him in the beginning. But not his child. The Lord won't let his child do that. Now, we in our flesh might try to do something like that, but he won't let you. There's some people in this world 
from whom God will not take no for an answer. And that's his chosen people. That's those Christ redeemed. He's going to make us come to Christ. And Christ is going to break our heart and give us lowliness of mind. And that's not a one-time work, brethren. He does that in the first hour. But that's ongoing. We talk about the Lord restraining our flesh and subduing our flesh and, and renewing the inward man and the old man perishes day by day with the new man is renewed day by day. How does that happen? It's Christ keep continually doing this for us, bringing us to him to hear him speak. So what does he teach us when we come to him? Well, in John 7 there, verse 19 he turned to the Pharisees. They were accusing Christ and this impotent man of breaking the law because Christ healed him on the Sabbath and he picked up his bed and he walked on the Sabbath. So they were accusing him of breaking the law. And Christ says to him in verse 19, Did not Moses give you the law? Yet none of you keepeth the law. Why go you about to kill me? This is the first thing Christ is going to teach us when he, now he wasn't teaching them, he just said it and they heard it and went in one ear and out the other. But when he teaches you and me, from the first hour and every time after that that he's humbling us, he's going to make us to know none of us have ever kept the law. Not in the perfect righteousness which God demands, none of us have ever kept the law. And he's going to make that personal to me and to you that when he speaks in our heart, he's going to make you know, I'm the sinner. Here I am, puffed up in pride at, at a brother or a sister, and Christ is going to draw you to himself, and he's going to speak into your heart, and he's going to make you know, who made you to differ? What do you have that you didn't receive? I'm the sinner. I have no business to be offended or puffed up at anybody. I'm the sinner. And he makes us know this. And this is how he's going to subdue our pride and how he's going to renew us and keep continue to grow us and make us confess to him, I'm the sinner. He's going to make us confess what the psalm, psalmist confessed in Psalm 38, 7, that in my loins they're filled with a loath, loathsome disease. All my sin nature is is sin and pride. There's no soundness in my flesh. Paul said in me dwells in my flesh dwells no good thing. He's going to keep us ever mindful of that. He has to, doesn't he? We get to thinking ourselves a little too big for our britches, don't we? He has to keep reminding us. I'm the sinner. What you contribute to salvation? I sin. That's all. That's all. And then he's going to make you behold this. He turned to him and he said, he said there at the end of... Uh, End of verse 23, he said, You're angry at me because I made a man every whit whole on the Sabbath day. He's going to make us to know he made us every whit whole, that you're complete in him. And he's going to make you know that, and he's going to also remind you that's so of your brother, that's so of your sister. He made them every whit whole. He's going to make you know he circumcised you in the heart. He's not a Jew which is one outwardly. Circumcision is not that outward in the flesh. That's what the Pharisees were boasting of. They said that made them differ. Something they had done in their flesh by the works of their hands made them to differ. He said that's not even true circumcision. Circumcision is in the heart. That's what the outward pictured. It pictured the heart where God has circumcised the heart, regenerated you, and made you a Jew, true Jew, inwardly. Made you see you a true child of God. And the praise is not of man, the praise is of God. And when he does that work and gives you faith to believe him, he's going to make you see that at Calvary's cross, Christ circumcised us there, putting off our body of sin entirely forever. Go to Colossians 2 and we'll read this whole thing together. Colossians 2. Colossians 2 verse 10. This is what we have to be reminded of. First, we have to be brought to Christ, have to be reminded I'm the sinner, and then have to be remem remember the only righteousness I have is Christ. And that's true of my brethren. And he says here, Colossians 2.10, you are complete in him. Believer, you're complete in him. 
He's the head of all principality and power, in whom also you are circumcised with a circumcision made without hands and putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. You've been buried with him in baptism. That's not talking about water baptism. That's talking about when he was immersed in the judgment of God on the cross, you were buried with him in that judgment. When he went in the grave, you went in the grave. That's so of all his elect, wherein also you're risen with him through the faith of the operation of God who raised him from the dead. And then he came to you and preached the gospel to you, and you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, bringing us to faith in Christ, having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. So when he makes you know that and make, reminds you, I don't have any righteousness in me. What am I sitting here being offended about? I'm a sinner. That's all I am. That's all I do. That's my name. That's what I do is sin. I can't pray without sinning. I can't repent of my sin without sinning. I can't believe God without sinning. I can't preach the gospel without sinning. You think about how much sin is in what we do. It's just, it's just so much pride in everything we do. We even talk about pride. We've, we've given pride and made it sound pretty. We say of our children that work hard, I'm so proud of you. Should we be proud of anything? It would be better to say, whatever you do, do it as unto the Lord. Pride in any form is pride. I don't care what you're proud of. We can make our children idols. Pride is pride. And it's sin. What do we have to be proud of? If my children worked hard, who gave them the ability to do it? If I have anything to be happy about in you or my brethren or my children, who gave me, he gave that to you to make me happy? God did. What do you have that you didn't receive from God? Rather than me being swollen up and proud, I ought to thank God. <laughs> he did it. He did it. But he makes you remember, I'm crucified with Christ. So's my brother. I'm risen with Christ. So's my brother. I'm righteous and complete in him. So's my brother. God says, who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It's God to justify. Yea, rather, it's Christ that died and is risen again and seated at the right hand of God making intercession for his people. Who's going to lay anything to the charge of my people? He says, that's so of me. And that's so of my brethren. And you know what else he makes you remember? Christ said this, whether it's good or bad that I do to my brother, Christ said, and as much as you've done it to one of these, the least of my brethren, you have done it to me. Whew. That makes me want to make sure whatever I'm doing to my brother, I want it to be good. <laughs> because I'm doing it to Christ. I'm doing it to Christ. But if it's bad, I'm doing it to Christ. That's how one he is with you, believer. That's how one he is in his people. Whatever we do to a brother or sister, we're doing it to Christ. Now, that'll humble you, won't it? That'll bring us down from our pride. I don't have anything to be proud of. Everything I have, Christ is and gave me. And the same is true of my brethren. And he says here, with the well-advised is wisdom. When he does this, listen to this. Proverbs 12, 15 says, The way of a fool is right in his own eyes. And when we're playing the fool and we're going to this word to justify ourselves, we're going to think the way we found is right, and it's going to be right in our own eyes, even using the word of God. The Pharisees crucified Christ, calling out glory to God, thinking they were doing something that God was well pleased with, and they said, now get him down off the cross so we can get back to our religion and not break the Sabbath. A way of a fool's right in his own eyes. What's going to be the difference to make us see what this word says and hear it? He that hearkeneth unto counsel is wise. Christ's going to make us hearken to him. That's the only way we really hear the word and know the truth. Now go to James 3. 
James chapter 3. When he makes you hearken to his counsel, the wisdom that he gives you, now listen, when we think of wisdom, we're so, we're so influenced by this world. When we think of wisdom, we think of something to be proud of. We think of being wiser than somebody else. I know more, so I ought to be touted as being wise. That ain't wisdom. That's sinful flesh. That's pride. Wisdom is meekness. Esteeming others better. That's wisdom. Listen now, James 3, 13. Who is a wise man and endued with knowledge among you? Let him show out of a good conversation his works with meekness of wisdom. That's the wisdom our text is talking about. With the well-advised is wisdom, meekness of wisdom. But if you bite, if, or if you have bitter envying and strife in your heart, what he say? Where did he say that comes from? Only by pride. Now watch what he says: Glory not, lie not against the truth. This wisdom descended not from above, but is earthly, sensual, devilish. For where envying and strife is, there is confusion and every evil work. Only by strife cometh contention. But with the well advised, those been well advised by Christ, look. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, easy to be entreated. Think about sinners coming to Christ. He was so meek and lowly that vile sinners weren't afraid to go to him. They, that woman with the issue of blessed, if I can just touch the hem of his garment. Sinners came to him. Lord, if you will. They didn't go to the Pharisees. They were scared to death to go to the Pharisees. Those were fleshly wise men. Proud. And they'd make you they'd throw it back in your teeth and make you know they was a wise men, and you're just a scum. Christ said, Come to me. I'm meek and lowly. And the wisdom he gives is easy to be entreated. You can come and confess and speak and and, and be received where true wisdom is. You won't, you won't get a stiff neck. You won't get somebody poking out your chest. and Well, I'd never do that. Easy to be entreated. Full of mercy and good fruits. Without partiality. It doesn't do this just to the rich brother and the poor one. <laughs> Treat differently. Without partiality. Without hypocrisy. It's sincere. And the fruit of righteousness... Want to produce some fruit? The fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that he blesses to make peace. Sown in peace. We get, this, we get in this place where we think that somebody has offended and now they're going to have to repent. They're going to have to Conf they're going to have to come and confess that they've sinned and, and because that's, Christ makes us repent. Christ makes us come to him and repent. They're going to have to repent. But what we forget is, it's only Christ that makes us repent. We can't make another person repent. But in our pride, we start setting up these walls that you've got to meet such and such and such criteria, and then I'll be merciful and forgive you. That's our pride. That's our pride. But he makes you to realize if I go on in that, all that's going to produce, it's going to feed the flesh of my brother or sister, and it's going to feed their pride, and it's going to be pride that's going to spring up. That's all it's going to do. Judgment, he said, with what judgment you judge, you'll be judged. And one of the things that means is if I face you with pride and deal with you in pride, you know what that's going to do? You know what that's going to do to you. If somebody comes to me in pride, they're going to feed the pride in my flesh. But when Christ teaches you this, and he really makes you humble and brings you down from that, he makes you realize, if I go on in this pride, it's just going to produce more pride and strife and division. And he makes you not want that. He makes you want to seek peace. I'll give you an example. 
King David. Saul, wicked Saul, who King Saul was going after David every way he could, threw a javelin at him, went with his whole army trying to kill him. Multiple times he tried to kill him. David had done nothing to Saul. And finally, he had Saul in a cave, and he had the opportunity to kill him. And his men even told him. They said, the Lord's delivered him into your hand. This is time right here that God's given you. You can kill Saul. And David said, that's God's anointed. He was just talking about the fact that he was a king that God anointed. And, but even with that, he said, that's God's anointed. I can't touch him. And David went to Saul, this one that was guilty and had committed all these offenses at David. And David had committed none against him. And David went to him and bowed down and sought peace from Saul. That's where Christ brings you. That's the meekness of wisdom. Right there. That's where he keeps us. That's where he keeps bringing us. Go with me to Philippians 2. I know you're weary. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wind this up. But Philippians 2. He says, verse 1, If there's any consolation in Christ, any comfort in Christ, any comfort of love, any fellowship of the Spirit, bowels and mercies, Fulfill ye my joy that you be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord and of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory. That just comes from pride, doesn't it? But in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own thing, that is, self-serving, but every man also on the things of others, serving brethren. Now listen, here it is. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. What did he do? Being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Here it is. He made himself of no reputation. He took upon him the form of a servant. He was made in the likeness of men and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself. And became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross, wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name above every name. Now turn, I want you to read that last phrase. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name above every name. Go to 1 Peter 5. I don't know if you ever made this connection, but I want you to see this. Peter at one point got lifted up with pride. Remember that? He said, he said, Lord, these, these, these other disciples, I won't be surprised one bit if they, if they forsake you. They'll deny you. I don't, I, I've always been a little questionable about some of these. They're they going to deny you. I won't do that, though. Lord said, Peter, you're going to deny me three times before the rooster crows. And he did it. Our Lord Jesus, his humility in serving God and his brethren unto the cross was obedience that highly exalted God. What he was doing was he humbled himself under God's mighty hand. And he subjected himself to his brethren. He subject, he bowed down and washed our feet. That was a picture of what he was doing, going to the cross, washing us every whit. Subjected himself to his brethren. This is God come down and did this he humbled himself under God's hand trusting God on that cross that when he trusted himself and his brethren to God that when he had satisfied justice and made his people righteous God would exalt him and that highly exalted God all of that highly exalted God. That was committing it all to God. That was trusting himself and his brethren to God who was able to, to raise him. All of that was serving his brethren in humility. And that is all our righteousness. That, that service is all our hope and all our salvation. And because of that, it says, Wherefore God also highly exalted him. Now watch this. First Peter 5.5 5. The second part, he says, all of you be subject one to another. 
and be clothed with humility. For God, Peter knows what he's talking about, God resisted the proud, and he gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. Cast in all your care upon him, for he careth for you. That's what Christ did on the cross. He committed it all to God. He humbled himself in God's mighty hand, trusting that God would exalt him in God's time. And that's what God did. Peter said, I had to learn this the hard way. And I'm saying to you, brethren, subject yourself to your brethren. Serve one another in humility. And as you do, and he's talking about when a brother sinned, when the brothers offended you, when they've crossed you. He says, subject yourself to them, serve them with all humility, speak of what Christ has done for us, try to restore them to Christ, and all the while trusting them to Christ, who is their master, who alone is able to make them stand. Because you can't do it by pride. And if we try to do it, that's all it is, is pride. And he said, that right there is highly exalting God. So submit it to him and, and cast it all on Christ. Christ will handle it. He'll handle it. Put on bowels of mercy, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. Well, what if a brother's overtaken in a fault? What if he sins? You which are spiritual. Restore such a one in the spirit of meekness. Considering yourself, make guard, guard yourself, lest you also be tempted. Tempted to what? If a man think himself to be something when he's nothing, he deceives himself. So he's saying, bear one another's burden. That means... That sin that's so offensive. That means when the brother's being ugly. That means when they're not acting like they ought to act. Bear one another's burdens. And so fulfill the law of Christ. That law that he said, love your brethren as I have loved you. How'd he do it? He bore all our burden and he bore it away. And he says, you'll highly exalt Christ doing that. And in due time, he'll honor that. He'll honor that. Remember that. Remember this. You know this. You hate it when your pride swells up in you and causes you to be puffed up. You hate that. I do too. Well, know that that brother or sister who swelled up in pride, they hate it too in themselves. Worst thing I can do is pour gasoline on that fire. The best thing to do is when another brother is puffed up, the best thing you can do is humble yourself. Be more meek and more gentle and more kind and more gracious because that's what God's going to bless to that brother's heart to bring him down. And we tend to do the opposite, don't we? We tend to think well, meet force with force. It ain't that ain't how God works it. Commit it to Christ. Help one another to Christ. All right. Thank you, brethren. Thank you, brother. We have been well advised in wisdom. <laughs> uh, we'll have uh, Brother Mike come lead us in a final hymn, and then uh, there in the back we'll have some chicken wings and salad, and there ought to be a couple big pizzas showing up at 7.30. So he got half the tip beforehand. He'll get the other half he gets here at 7.30. So uh, we ought to have plenty of food there in the back. I encourage everybody to stay and, and uh, give Clay a big warm welcome and a and a sweet goodbye he's going to take off early in the morning so anyway let's pray together father thank you for this time thank you for your servant thank you for your word that you've given us Lord, bless it to the hearts of your people 
Make us meek and lowly. Make us see ourselves. Make us see Christ lifted up. Oh, Lord, let us put our, cast all of our cares to him, not try to fix it ourselves. What a rest we have in Christ. What a salvation. Lord, thank you for our brethren. Thank you for your gospel. Bless this evening to us, this time of fellowship. And it's in Christ's name that we ask it. Amen.